hello again. We're honored to have Deputy White House Social Secretary Samantha Tubman with us tonight. Thank you, Sam, for your invaluable help in making this year's luncheon at the White House and our Teen Design Fair in DC such an unforgettable success. Thank you, Caroline. Hello, everyone. I want to begin by expressing how honored I am to be here tonight on behalf of the First Lady, Michelle Obama. I would also like to express my, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we love her. I would also like to express my condolences to all of those who knew and loved Bill Moggridge. I know that the First Lady enjoyed getting to know Bill over the past few years and believed his creative genius would live on for generations to come. Although Mrs. Obama could not attend this evening's festivities, I would like to convey her sincere gratitude to all of you who have done, that you have done to inspire us with your innovative ideas and creative designs. By educating the public and promoting excellence, innovation, and lasting achievement in design, each of this evening's awardees is improving the lives of individuals across our country and around the world. It is truly my honor to congratulate this year's award winners. The work you are doing in the fields of education, business, and community engagement is truly inspiring, and I'm thrilled to be here. In the words of Mrs. Obama, thank you, thank you, to the designers who have reached the tops of their fields, not by chasing glory for themselves, but instead by making life more glorious for the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. The National Design Awards were launched in 2000 as an official project of the White House Millennium Council, giving us the opportunity over these 13 years to celebrate 122 extraordinary members of the design community, all listed in your gala programs. Winners, with tonight's celebration, you have now joined the National Design Awards family. We look forward to welcoming you back to celebrate the awards with us each year. Design is the profession that allows you to make things better. <laughs> Everything that surrounds us is designed by somebody. If people just reflected on their day-to-day -day life going through space, what appeals to them and what doesn't, and why? I think what's really interesting about design is that like so much of life, it's a social process. I think the National Design Award is special because it's given by the Cooper Hewitt. I mean, the Cooper Hewitt is the most important design institution in the world. I'd like to thank the Cooper Hewitt, um, for one, for liberating all of us from our disciplines. We should applaud this because they've made design something that's universal. The National Design Award is really a recognition of excellence. The highest honor I can yes. ever imagine because of the fact that it's design. the Smithsonian, the Cooper Hewitt, it's about design. I mean, it's sort of the Academy Award of design. There's nothing better, nothing higher. That the First Lady of the United States will meet the winners is more than an honor. And that is the defining characteristic of today's honorees. All of them have done something really good for our country uh, and our world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this award. This is so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper Hewitt. Thank you, everybody. I love that video. We are thrilled to have 27 past honorees with us tonight. Would all National Design Award honorees, past and present, please stand so that we may recognize you for your prof profound contributions to design.
We begin the evening with the non-juried Design Patron Award, which is selected by Cooper Hewitt. The Design Patron Award recognizes enlightened leaders and their patronage of good design. Joining this gifted group is Red Burns. Earlier this year, when Bill and I sat down to discuss the Design Patron Award, it wasn't a long conversation. Red was the obvious choice. As the founding chair of the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU, Red has shaped and influenced the way we have all interacted with media for over four decades. She has nurtured the innovative careers of over 3,000 ITP students, who have gone on to shape the world of digital media as we know it today and as, as it will become tomorrow. Cooper Hewitt is thrilled to honor a true pioneer, Red Burns, with the title of Design Patron for 2012. Thank you, Carolyn. I feel deeply honored to have been recognized by you and Bob. Bill, thank you so much, Cooper Hewitt, for fostering design information, innovation. I have a smiling face right there. <laughs> but I am deeply honored, and I do thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Red. It is now my pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, eight-time Emmy Award-winning journalist, Paula Zahn. Paula is back for the third time celebrating the National Design Awards with us. She has hosted daily news programs on ABC, CBS, and CNN. Her exciting show, On the Case with Paula Zahn, airs on Discovery ID. An accomplished cellist herself, Paula also co-hosts Sunday Arts on Channel 13, which covers music, the visual arts, architecture, and design. Paula, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Caroline. Did anybody tell you how lovely you look in orange tonight? Yeah. You look fabulous. And good evening, and thank you all for supporting Cooper Hewitt by joining us here tonight. It is an honor to be back with you this evening to celebrate the full spectrum of American design practice. We begin with an award that recognizes design thinking. The Design Mind Awards recognizes individuals who have changed design thinking or practice through their writing, research, and scholarship a wonderful addition to the many brilliant minds honored over the years is Janine Benyus. <laughs> Janine co-founded the first bio-inspired consultancy, the Biomimicry Guild in 1998, encouraging us all to take a closer look at nature in order to replicate its sustainable design solutions. Since then, she has inspired hundreds in the corporate design and education communities to solve complex problems through principles of biomimicry. Here to present the Design Mind Award is industrial designer and best dress designer here this evening, Roth Lovegrove. Thank 
Okay. Uh, uh, normally, I don't speak with notes, um, but tonight I have to. So, if you just excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> I've got rather a lot to say here tonight. Wait, I hope you find this funny. That's what I'm about to do. Now, where are these notes? I just couldn't, I just couldn't print the Romney one. I couldn't at all. Yeah. Please vote for Obama. Um, I've got 90 seconds, apparently. Um, I first met uh, Janine um, about eight years ago uh, at a TED conference in Monterey. <clears throat> it was called uh, Inspired by Nature, uh, which is a subject we share with a passion. <clears throat> I found um, in Janine somebody who... Mm, uh, a really great mind that could um, maybe transform the philosophy of what we do in design. <clears throat> in my own practice, I find it quite difficult to penetrate uh, the clients with some of this great thinking because it's just too easy uh, to make the things that we make. But I think maybe in the future, when we can find a solution <clears throat> which will um, form a, a, a kind of cycle, a cycle which um, gets the real root of design, meaning design at a, almost a nano level, when we can use those building blocks of materials to make exactly what we need. I mean, there's some great designers in the audience today, and I think that certainly within uh, my lifetime, I hope to see uh, the fruits of some of this coming through. And when I talk to Janine, we talk about how to design a telephone, biologically, for example. We talk about um, natural phenomena that uh, create, create electricity and so on. They're, they're, it's all out there. It's just a little bit convenient at the moment what we do. And, you know, when I look at, you know, my iPhone, as beautiful as it is, designed by Johnny, all that comes out of the earth. All of that. Every car is out there, comes out of the rock and the dust. I find that extraordinary. But what Janine is going to pioneer uh, for us over the years is a transformation in our industrial state. And it's uh, because of that I'm very proud tonight to, uh, to have come over <clears throat> and uh, have this opportunity to uh, share the evening. So, Janine, please. <laughs> Thanks, Ross. There are so many dreamers and doers in the sustainability movement um, who have nurture, nurtured me, uh, like Ross, and I am forever grateful. Thank you. Uh, this is a hallelujah moment for biomimicry. It really is. To, be, to stand here with the people who dream our world into being so creatively and have you acknowledge biomimicry as as something that influences you in your work and is useful to you in your work is, um, well, it's a joyous and humbling thing for me. Uh, I, I'm here on behalf of and because of tens of thousands of biomimics. And these are people who look to the natural world for wisdom um, to figure out how to redesign everything so that we can fit in here on this home planet. Come home here at last and for good. That's what biomimics do. And seeing nature as a mentor instead of a warehouse of goods is a powerful act. Those, those of us here can attest to that. Whom you choose to emulate, uh, whom you want to be like when you grow up, can change the direct trajectory of your life. And as biomimics, we choose 
the furred, the winged, the exoskeleton, the single-celled, the four-legged. We see in them design brilliance evolved in context. Together, they teach us how to live gracefully and generously on this planet. Um, I'm hoping that someday the Design Mind Award will be given to them, to the organisms that inspire us. Um, organisms have also taught me that we don't succeed alone, and so I want to thank my co-founders, Dana Baumeister, we've been at this about 14 years, uh, Chris Allen, Brian E. Schwann, in our social enterprise now. Um, I want to thank my team um, of people in biomimicry 3.8, uh, our social enterprise, um, my home flock, my partner Laura Merrill of 25 years who's with me tonight, uh, my friends who would never believe I was standing here, a uh, shy rabbit writer turned into troubadour, not sure how that happened. Um, well, I am because actually it's a gift to find work that you love and that you think is necessary. And you giving Biomimicry this award um, renews us. Uh, it says to us that we should keep on bringing nature's wisdom um, to you, to the people who design our world. Um, every design, every decision being made, um, I'm hoping that nature will be at your table with you. Thank you so much for seeing this work and supporting it. It means the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, and congratulations, Janine. The Corporate and Institutional Achievement Award recognizes companies and organizations for placing design at the center of their institutional strategy. On the screens beside me, you can see those who have previously been honored with this award. And joining this esteemed list is Design That Matters. <laughs> Led by co-founder Timothy Prestero, this nonprofit organization was conceived by graduate students at the MIT Media Lab back in 2001. Design That Matters has created revolutionary products that address basic needs in developing countries, including a projector for nighttime adult literacy in Africa, a low-cost neonatal incubator using spare car parts, and more recently, a phototherapy device for treating newborn jaundice in Vietnam. Here to present the award is John Mayetta president of the Rhode Island School of Design. John. Hello, I'm a stand-in presenter. I'm standing here in front of you and I've been nervous, but I'm um, glad to be here. Uh, I no design that matters, uh, but I had to figure out what to say uh, an hour beforehand, and I was looking at the name Design That Matters, which means all of us else don't matter. <laughs> now, why is it important? It's important because Design That Matters came from students. And as a professor for many years at MIT, I always knew the secret was that the students knew more than the professors so often. But you had to get shown up. And I recall the time when Design That Matters was a class at the MIT Media Lab. And us professors were all saying, oh my gosh, there's a class. And it's being taught by students and no professors. It can't be any good. And lo and behold, years later, it matters. So welcome, Timothy. Yeah, design that matters, kind of enormous hubris, if only we'd known uh, 10 years ago. 
So when I was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Africa back in the 90s, international aid was really thought about in terms of charity. Uh, the big idea was appropriate technology. Uh, imagine, in the worst case, that this is sort of the Swiss Family Robinson knocking together stuff out of coconuts and bamboo. Uh, a decade later, enter the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. So the poor in developing countries were no longer seen as recipients of charity, but rather they were seen as potential customers. Um, the big idea became value engineering. So if we can make stuff cheap enough, the, I, I forgot to turn it the right way, darn it. Uh, we make stuff cheap enough and millions of people in Africa can afford medical devices, cook stoves, cell phones, bicycles, the kind of stuff we take for granted here in the United States. So look, uh, charity or capitalism, throwing gadgets out of helicopters into villages or, or selling it in village markets, Design That Matters was established to solve a different problem. See, context matters. Behavior matters. In fact, affordability is, is uh, rarely the most significant obstacle to successfully implementing products and services in developing countries. As designers, we recognize that cheaper Cheaper as a goal has a floor, but better has no ceiling. Uh, as designers, we make products better. So great design, in terms of making the world a better place, is about accepting that there's no such thing as a dumb user, but boy, there are lots and lots of dumb products. Uh, great design means refusing to accept good excuses for failure. And it means establishing that social impact is the bottom line. So Design That Matters was built by a cast of thousands. And were there a bigger stage, we'd all be here to recognize or to receive this wonderful recognition, uh, but they're not. So I'd like to thank some of our supporters. For example, the Lemelson Foundation and Ike and Rosemary Van Otterloo, who have, who have really put the fuel into the rocket ship that's Design That Matters. I'd, I'd like to thank our students and our professional volunteers, where hundreds of them, where we've gotten so many great ideas. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Elizabeth Johansson and William Harris, who can't be here eating this fantastic food tonight, uh, but they've, their commitment and their great work. Um, so last week, we were talking about Christmas a little early, and my two boys said that they were going to give me, they picked out something, basically my favorite thing to give me for Christmas. They were going to give me a computer and more work. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to my wife, Elizabeth, who's over at table 24, if you want to meet somebody amazing my sons Brandon and Alessandro for, for really their patience and their support on this amazing adventure. And I'd like to say thank you to the Cooper Hewitt for recognizing our little tiny organization. So thank you very much. Congratulations to Tim and his colleagues at Design That Matters. Uh, on to architecture now. Uh, today's architects face the challenge of transforming the private and public places where we live and where we work. And adding to this amazing list is this year's award winner, a team, Mac Scoggin and Merrill Elam Architects. Mac and Merrill have worked together for more than 40 years. Their diverse work is uniquely characterized by profound rigor, tempered by childlike innocence. Mac and Merrill have altered the built environment in Atlanta and elsewhere, yet have found the time to be abundantly generous in their support of emerging talent within the field. Here to present the Architecture Design Award is architectural advisor, and critic Karen Stein. Let's face it, architecture is a tough profession. I'm not an architect, so I can say it with the confidence of someone who sees it up close and is not complaining about my own trials and tribulations. So let's just agree that architecture is a tough profession and to a certain extent, a, game, a survival game. Now imagine there is some clear formula for success in architecture. It's a silly idea, I know, but let's just imagine there was some predetermined path architects could follow to achieve success. 
If there was such a road to follow and someone offered to show them the way, Mac and Merrill would nod, smile politely, and run in the other direction. They are allergic to anything that smacks of easy answers or established formulas. Instead, they go their own way. Typically, architects are obsessed with the sublime and the timeless. Mac and Merrill preach the gospel of the uglyful. Yes, uglyful. Needless to say, that's not a word most clients want to hear. Mac and Merrill's obsession with the uglyful, the realm of the strangely familiar and with the carnival that is daily life, is what makes their work difficult to describe even as it leaves an indelible impression. They have said that their work resides in the gap between the functional and the dysfunctional, the rational and the irrational. What they haven't said is that within this gap, they manage to hold childlike wonder and well-earned wisdom in exquisite balance. They defy norms not out of arrogance or neg negligence, but with stunning humility. They truly believe that architecture is not a thing, but an experience, and that their most lasting contribution is to stimulate the imagination. Curiosity, they show us, can be life-changing. Yes, they go their own way, and sometimes their journeys are truly far out. But like seasoned space travelers, they always return to Earth. And when Mac and Merrill, our veritable astronauts of architecture, touch down, they share what they have learned. And the central lesson is always the same, that great architecture is about heart and soul. Heart and soul, two qualities they both have in abundance. And for this and much more, I'm honored to present them with this award. It is difficult for us to say how proud we are to be receiving this award. In thinking about the award, it reminded us that architecture is a fact of culture. And at the same time, it is the responsibility of the architect to react to or resist that fact. We would like to think that over the years in our work, we have reacted to this fact in a manner reflected in this short excerpt from a poem by Diane Ackerman, which she wrote for Zoe, age five. Come picnic on Mars. Why don't we take a fiery stroll straight up to Mars, you and I? We will pack a mental picnic for years before we go. Some will say the sky's the, answer, the limit, but we will answer no, the mind was made to travel. So come and take the waters that jet across the seas that lie between the planets we crawl to on metal knees. Oh, when we arrive, what fancy stuff we'll see. The swooning sands of paradise, dust devils, a volcanic sea. So we went to the White House. <laughs> and we met the First Lady, Michelle Obama. And she's really huge. She's really big. Completely awestruck. She said something to me he's like, congratulations, you've been doing this a really long time. <laughs> and I bumbled and said something like, oh, we're just getting started. And she said to me, I understand. <laughs> we are just getting started. We're a lot younger than we look. <laughs> we've been made young by the people that we've worked with for these 40 years. I didn't know that you were going to actually say that, but those over 40 years. We've really been blessed. We've worked with some of the most amazing young people in our field, in our discipline, both in our practice and in academia that have kept us alive and well and, and very young and anxious and hungry to do architecture. Our clients have been remarkable. 
the most patient, the most curious. Uh, and I think for us, the most sharing people that you could ever imagine. Some of them are here with us tonight, and we really, really appreciate them being here. This is truly a happy moment for us. We'd like to think, again, that it's a, it's a kind of a new beginning, and we'd like to thank the Cooper Hewitt and the brilliant jury that chose us, <laughs> that chose us at the, uh, a very special moment in our, in our time in, in life in architecture, which we really love, and we really love being around the young people in this profession and giving them a hint of what uh, the possibilities of architecture would be for the future. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mac and Merrill. Uh, designers in the next category continually refine and reinvent the way we exchange ideas and information. This year's winner for communication design is Rebecca Mendes. Rebecca's career spans almost 30 years as a designer, creative director, artist, and professor at UCLA. She leads a multidisciplinary studio focusing on design solutions for art, architecture, and other cultural clients. Her work is informed by critical reflections on visual communication practices, and in particular, on brand identity and consumer culture. Here to present the Communication Design Award is Bob Stein, founder of the Criterion Collection and the Voyager Company, two of the early electronic publishing imprints. You know, it's really fantastic when a person of genius is also a wonderful human being. And that's pretty much it for Rebecca. She's just fantastic, and it gives me a huge amount of pleasure to be here. I, I met Rebecca 20 years ago at a moment when uh, David Carson was uh, out there saying that type should be a design element, and it didn't actually have to be read to be a value. And Rebecca was standing out there almost by herself saying, actually, that's not true. Type can be really beautiful, it can be a design element, but it can also be absolutely legible. And I, I, I fell in love with her work at that moment. It, took a, it was a long time before I actually got to work with her. I got a, a, a huge grant from somebody and I hired Rebecca to develop a website for us. And that was when I learned how, what a great designer could be. Because we gave her a problem and she came back to us and returned it to us in a way that was far beyond our own understanding of it. She gave it a name that we never would have come up with, a name actually that has been adopted by uh, groups around the world. And that ability sort of to dig into the content of the problem is a rare thing and Rebecca has it more than any designer I've ever met. And the third the third thing I'd like to mention is her generosity. I, I had occasion to sort of, uh, I, I gave Rebecca a problem for her students at UCLA. It was a class in book design. And I got to sort of kibitz and hang out there for a, a semester while these students did this work. And it was really remarkable to see a designer of Rebecca's abilities gives so much of herself to these students. And the work they produced, I, I thought was fantastic. If I could take it as a whole, I could put it in any gallery in Chelsea and it would sell out immediately. Um, but it was, the, it, it, was, it was Rebecca's generosity of spirit that really came through and which really marks all of her work. And so it gives me a huge amount of pleasure to give this award to her.
Congo and I have something to say to you. Thank you all. But Bob, it was 20 years ago when we met that in a lecture, Bob said, how is it possible that we can be or we can become better ancestors? And that is something that I have been asking myself every time I initiate a project and it has become like the guiding principle to know that whatever I'm doing has meaning for further generations. So I'm so grateful for that. And of course, I thank the National, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the National Award, the staff, the jury, again, yes, brilliant jury that chose us, and um, everybody, because I know there's so many more people that everybody that's behind that kindly conspired to make this happen. I am very, very grateful to you, and especially that one mysterious person who nominated me. I will not know, but I'm very, very thankful. Um, I have had, of course, many mentors, so many I cannot really um, uh, count uh, here and, and enumerate, but um, I am really thankful to all of you. You have guided me and inspired me, and in turn, I'm able to guide and inspire all of my students and those who come after me. Especially, I would like to remember Eiko Ishioka. She was an amazing guide to me and no longer is with us, but she be continues to be a beacon in my life. I also want to thank all of those people that actually have championed me. You need that. You need people that believe in you, like Bob, like Ellen Lupton, like Brian Collins. There's so many people here, Tom Main, um, Frank Gehry. They have believed in me and given me an opportunity to play with them, or like Frank would say, to bring juice to their office. <laughs> Some of you might know him. Um, but of course, I would like to primarily thank my parents who are here. They're somewhere back there. I'm so happy they're here. My father, Oscar Luis Mendez Conde. My mother, Rosalinda Teresa Sanchez Caballero de Mendez Conde. You must know we definitely give ourselves a lot of names. But that they have, they have put me in a path. They taught me a way to see the world, that it was not only about the beauty and the poetics of something, of the things in the world, but it was primarily about understanding how things function, how they work, how is it that these forces come together to give form, for make all these incredible natural, uh, natural phenomena emerge. So in a sense, both chemists, chemical engineers, they taught me the nature of matter and how it organizes the systems, the cycles, the behavior of things, and that it is through those collisions or those frictions that really things come together. And for that, I am most grateful because it's a way that I see the world. They also, in a way that they, they through their example, they help me fall in love with life in every aspect of it. And it really is by seeing them doing that. And if you do not fall in love with what you do, it is very difficult for you to put your entire intelligence, passion, understanding, intuition, so that you make actually something come together and has vitality. And so for that, I am so, so happy. Thank you, Papi and Mami. I adore you. <laughs> And of course, I cannot forget my dearest, adorable Adam, my husband, and my friend, and my companion, who we have gone through so much to make this happen. We have adventures. We sometimes are breaking our backs. I'm breaking his back, primarily. So um, you are my dearest friend. Your kindness, your relentless support, it is incredibly humbling. And I love you. Thank you. Congratulations, Rebecca. The landscape architecture category recognizes those who investigate and plan our experiences with public spaces, parks, and gardens. Joining this remarkable list is Stoss Landscape 
urbanism is, established in 2000 by Chris Reed and later joined by Scott Bishop. Stoss is a collaborative design and planning studio in Boston that operates in an emerging field known as landscape urbanism, which unites infrastructure, functionality, and ecology to make our urban communities better places to live, work, and play. Here to present the Landscape Architecture Award is Moshin Mostafavi, Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the Alexander and Victoria Wiley Professor of Design. Well, it's a great honor to be here tonight with so many wonderful people, so many creative people. Uh, special congratulations to uh, Max Coggin and Mary Lila for their great work and their wonderful projects. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a special moment for landscape architecture today. Uh, it's, of course, a special moment for design broadly, but I think landscape architecture is going through, a, through an incredible renaissance because of the scale of things that it's dealing with, because of the types of things that it's dealing with, and I think we're very, very lucky to uh, have as the winners uh, Stoss LU, um, a firm that really covers this, this incredible range of practices from uh, what might at times be called land art to uh, gardens, uh, parks, but really this uh, special also emphasis on the development and investigations of the larger scale projects and larger scale territory. We are at a moment when most of our cities are being developed often through the, um, the design of individual buildings. And it's very hard to really think about how we think about the, the large scale and the spaces between buildings. So, Landscape architects are occupying now a special place where they can really help us think in a much more environmental fashion. We have heard uh, quite a bit tonight about the values and importance of, of ecological and sustainable practices. And I think uh, it, is, um, it is something that, that Stoss LU have really made a focus of being able to cross these disciplines, these practices, and these territories. And I think they are a firm that really are at the forefront of uh, landscape architecture today. And I think it's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be able to um, present this award to uh, Chris Reed and uh, to Scott Bishop. Hello, good evening. Uh, thanks, this is a special night for us, a very special night. And Moisen, I'm glad you could share it with us. It's, it's, it's really wonderful that you're here. Uh, as Moisen said, it is a special moment for landscape. Um, it comes at a time in when, which landscape is playing a central role in design discourse, um, in the discourse of urbanism, and in the making and remaking of cities everywhere. Uh, you have to walk just a couple blocks for evidence of this at the High Line, a few more blocks uh, to look at Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, and to begin to think about the extraordinary opportunities available uh, at larger scales with complex systems, with dynamic ecologies. I think landscape very much has jumped outside the garden wall, uh, beyond its horticultural roots, and is really capable of addressing some of the most pressing social and environmental uh, conditions across the globe um, today. And so to have the Cooper Hewitt recognize this uh, through our work, through this award, uh, is really incredibly rewarding, incredibly powerful, and incredibly meaningful. And so we're uh, very, very grateful. Uh, this is very much a collaborative effort. Um, there are many of us who have been uh, at work for many years. Uh, it started about 12 years ago. Um, and really my first note of thanks is to my wife, Paige, uh, who has been there all along sort of kicking me in the butt uh, and supporting me uh, and being really wonderful. Another part of it is the guy that's standing here who joined us about seven or eight years ago 
uh, and really has uh, allowed us to find our footing for the next 10 years. And he constantly reminds me to keep it light. Um, you want to say something? Yeah, I'd really like to say how much respect I have for the purple, the people that I that I work with on the day-to-day -day basis, and those are people like Jill Allen, who's at the table, people like Eric Prince, but there's also supporters like Charles Waldheim, who's also there, and of course uh, I have to also say, without the support of my wife and my family, I don't know where I would be, uh, and of course I have to say special. Uh, thanks to the Cooper Hewitt because they're supporting work that we're doing in the public realm and it's that recognition that really elevates what we do to really an art form so thank you very much for that. Great. I was apologizing because there was an errant word, is, that got added to the end of the name of their company. You don't need to rename it, really. Um, cards. Card, yeah, you don't have to reprint those. Uh, congratulations to Chris and Scott. Uh, the Fashion Design Award separates, or celebrates, that is, those who shape our personal identity with the clothes we wear, or covet, especially from many of our honorees. This year, the award goes to Tom Brown. Tom's fashions evoke the past with an updated sensibility. His innovative work challenges trends and conventions, and his collections continue to be meticulously handmade with an emphasis on uh, very fine details and quality. Tom designs the Black Feast, or Fleece, that is, by Brooks Brothers Collection for men and women, as well as the Montclair Gamme Bleu Collection. Here to present the Fashion Design Award is John Dempsey, Group President, and an old friend of the SD Lauder Companies. Hey, John. Well, it's a great honor to be here this evening to celebrate this award for Tom Brown, who is an amazing individual and an amazing designer. I've been a friend and a client of Tom for over a decade, and I don't have to tell many of you that Tom has had an incredible influence in the men's and women's fashion world around the world. Actually, before Mad Men was the number one rated television show in this country, the 60s vibe and the re-edit in terms of male masculinity and beauty was really redefined by Tom in his first capsule collections when he started at Bergdorf Goodman many years ago. Tom has dressed um, almost everyone and has um, gotten even myself to, from time to time, shorten my pants to show a little ankle. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, when you see Tom this later this evening, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But really, Tom's influence in terms of redefining men's fashion, women's fashion, and helping those to rediscover the iconic nature of Brooks Brothers with black fleece have been legendary and had a major impact in terms of fashion, design, and an evolution in terms of the way that we see style and fashion. So I'd like to present this award on behalf of Cooper Hewitt to Tom Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, John, it's, it's very special to get the award from you tonight because you have been such a good friend for um, really from the beginning, and also you are just one of the true individuals here in New York. So thank you very much. Um, well, I guess, um, firstly, I just want to thank the Cooper Hewitt so much for this award. It is so special to get this award, and I am humbled by getting it from an institution like the Cooper Hewitt. Um, I do approach my collections and my designs from a true design point of view and the commercial part of it I figure out afterwards and I think the Cooper Hewitt really appreciates the, the, uh, the concepts and the provocation that goes into my designs and I, I really appreciate that and I don't think they um, approached my work and asked, well, uh, probably from the video you could say like they didn't ask like who's going to wear that. Um, 
I also have to say that I'm humbled by being among the other recipients this year. Uh, we had a panel discussion a couple of days ago and I just, I sat back um, and I just marveled at the intelligence of the other uh, recipients, so I want to congratulate them all. And I kind of felt like the, the dumb kid in school by how intelligent they are. Um, also too, I think sometimes getting awards like this I feel a little selfish because there are so many people that go into my collections and what I do. So there's so many really talented and smart people that I work with who really inspire me and um, educate me and challenge me and then also embrace the crazy ideas that I have. So I, I want to accept this award for all of them because without them it wouldn't be it wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be uh, here. Um, I would be remiss in not singling out one person who has been with me from the beginning, Miki Higasa, who has really been with me from the beginning. And, and she, we have done everything together. And most of you probably know me and my collections because of Miki and uh, she has made it easy and she has made it so fun. Um, one person that probably would be embarrassed by my singling him out is the tailor who I've been working with from the beginning. One of the unsung heroes, Rocco Ciccarelli, who has really um, made, made the collections and he's one of the, the, the geniuses behind really everything that I've been able to develop in the world of fashion. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank um, Andrew also for educating me, inspiring me every day, and also just being with me and there for me uh, every day. So I really, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you so much for this award. For this award. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Tom. Thank you, John, for being here tonight. Uh, the Interaction Design Award highlights the work of those who have been game changers in the field of interactive digital products, environments, systems, and services. The 2012 winner is Evan Roth. Evan creates edgy, engaging interactions that push boundaries on what we see and what we experience. His approach takes inspiration from the free software movement and hacker ethos, leading to such notable pieces as laser tag, white glove tracking, and a collaboration with Jay-Z on the first open source hip hop video, an iWriter, a collaborative project designed to help a paralyzed graffiti artist to continue making his work. Evan could not be with us here tonight but uh, has this message for all of us. Greetings from Paris, everybody. It's a huge honor to be receiving this award alongside the other winners. I'm very sorry I couldn't be there in person to meet everybody involved with the National Design Awards. I'd like to send my deep thanks to the jury uh, and everyone at the Smithsonian and the Cooper Hewitt for what truly is an outstanding honor. I first began experimenting with interactivity by downloading source code from designers like Colin Mook and Joshua Davis, and it was because of their decision to share their work freely that I was able to begin moving things around on the screen with the mouse for the first time. Uh, later, I would have teachers like Zachary Lieberman, mentors like Jonah Peretti, who would teach me the larger significance of sharing code openly. Um, I've gained a lot from this community that prizes giving gifts over maximizing profits, and I'd like to share this award tonight um, with this community that does it for fun and gives it away for free. So thank you again. Uh, I hope to meet you all in the future, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Congratulations to Evan. Uh, we now come to the award for interior design, celebrating those who challenge our notion of interior environments. This year's interior design recipient is Clive Wilkinson Architects. 
Clive has helped to define a 21st century style of workplace by designing stimulating environments that connect people, shape relationships, and also empower organizations. His Los Angeles-based firm has completed more than 3 million square feet of creative workplace, educational, and housing projects all over the world. Here to present the Interior Design Award is former director of the VCU's Brand Center and for, uh, former chief creative officer and co-presidency of uh, Ogilvy, I say Mather, he says Mather, North America, Rick Boyko. It doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Uh, I just have to say this is a great evening and, and I wanted to uh, congratulate all the other recipients. This is an amazing evening and I'm just happy to be here. And I want to thank the jury for selecting me to be able to introduce the next person. Uh, t 12 years ago, I uh, was led around an agency that I used to work for at Shiat Day in their new headquarters in Playa del Rey. And for the first time, my eyes were lifted to actually see open architecture in a way that challenged creativity and forced collaboration in a way that had never been done, that I had seen prior to that. And I wanted my agency at the time, Ogilvy & Mather, to have open architecture and to challenge people to start to think in a much more collaborative way. Uh, I asked who the architect was, and it was Clive Wilkinson, and I instantly seeked him out. Uh, I later learned that another agency that I had seen and loved, Mother in London, who had been designed by Clive, uh, had uh, similar architecture that challenged and forced collaboration in a creative world. Uh, and so I asked Clive if he would work with me at Ogilvy to create a new space within our headquarters at 49th Street in Manhattan, which he said he would, and I said there would be great riches at the end of it. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, we got capital funding and we were ready to go and had new designs by the year 2000 and just when we were ready to start and initiate uh, destruction and remodeling, uh, the dot bomb happened and all our funding went away. Uh, three years later I left Ogilvy to become the director of the VCU Brand Center Virginia Commonwealth University, a state-funded university. Uh, and had an opportunity to create a new educational environment that once again could challenge creativity and force collaboration. And I instantly called Clive and said, look, would you like to help me create a new educational environment that would be something that would be unique and different? And we would have to do it within a historic building that was going to be torn down unless we actually and, and uh, invested in doing it. And he said, absolutely. I said, well, you're not going to get rich off of this one. Uh, and he said, I don't care. I want to work with you again. So I was fortunate enough to be able to work with Clive on two experiences, one that didn't happen and one that did. And in both instances, I was never more enriched. So it is my honor to introduce Clive Wilkinson. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, it is an overwhelming honor to, to be here tonight. Uh, I have to say um, <clears throat> that at the moment of, of learning that uh, uh, our firm had won this award, um, <clears throat> I, I sort of felt that a theft had taken place, um, that, that we were not worthy. And uh, <clears throat> um, our role is, is just you know one participant amongst so many in our business. and. Uh, I mean, in interior design and architecture, it takes hundreds, sometimes thousands of people to put together just one project, and it takes years. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, so it's, it's, it's incredibly participatory, it's in, incredibly collaborative. So kind of stealing the thunder for all of these other people feels, feels a bit like a theft, so I'm apologizing to all of them. <clears throat> They're all, all uh, uh, at least as deserving as I am. Um, <clears throat> in thinking, though, about what design was about and what this award probably is about, um, <clears throat> it felt like it was mostly about authorship. And because of all those participants in the process are not necessarily part of the authoring process. 
But <clears throat> the client is absolutely part of the authoring process for, for our uh, uh, profession specifically. And people like Rick <clears throat> behind me, who have, uh, it's absolutely wonderful he's here tonight, have been a complete inspiration and an education for me. Um, we've learned co collectively through um, understanding and uh, the creative workplace began with ad agencies and, and uh, ad agencies like TBWA Shire Day and <coughs> Ogilvy and Mather um, and places that Rick worked. We were uh, powerfully challenged as young architects uh, when we first started working with them. And that was <clears throat> back in 1990 when I was lucky enough to be working uh, for Frank Geary, who I believe is here somewhere tonight. Um, <coughs> and. Uh, that was the beginning of a transformation of understanding that uh, workplaces needed to be about community, and that large corporations needed to, f to, to think about their people differently and to start to understand that knowledge sharing was uh, um, <clears throat> the most important thing, that we were no longer in a kind of a routine industrial uh, era where people were cogs in a machine. Thank goodness. So we've gone through a journey, and it's, uh, it's been a huge collective journey, and I think it's been a, a wonderful experience for everyone. And um, <clears throat> I'm incredibly grateful that uh, you know, we could have played the role we did play. Um, I think uh, designers are, are really just, uh, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of the words of Paul Clay, um, way back in the 30s in the Bauhaus, who talked about um, the artist as being um, just the trunk of the tree. <clears throat> we're not the branches, we're not the leaves, we're not the magnificent foliage. We really are just the trunk of the tree. Uh, we have that role as a vessel um, to gather up the, the sources beneath us and <clears throat> try to, to uh, um, guide them into uh, a flourishing uh, um, foliage, <clears throat> the branching and, and extending out into space. And as, as the trunk of the tree itself is uh, formed, you... you uh, don't really know where all those branches are going, and you don't know what uh, specifically what, how you can you can shape that. But it happens, and it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great process. So I'm I'm super grateful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Congratulations to Clive and his team. Uh, the Product Design Award honors those who create and improve the consumer goods that we use in all facets of our lives, many of which have been designed by previous award winners. This year's honoree is Scott Wilson. Equal parts designer and entrepreneur, Scott has carved out a new path for innovators around the world by modeling a non-traditional business path. He has created some of the world's most recognized consumer designs, including his Chicago-based firm Minimal's collaboration with Microsoft on uh, Connect for Xbox 360, something my kids know all about, and TikTok and Lunatic watches for iPod Nano. Here to present the Product Design Award is Robert Arco, Creative Director at Coalesce. This evening uh, demands that I speak for some notes. I want to get this right. Um, first of all, just to be amongst the awards winners who all aspire to um, or represent the best of what design um, aspires to be is uh, uh, obvious. I'm amazed to be part of this this evening. I've had the pleasure of knowing Scott for over 10 years, beginning as colleagues at IDEO. Um, while we didn't work directly together, I followed his work, um, his incredible energy. The impact of his work was really obvious while I was there, and I followed him um, through his work at ACO and um, uh, Microsoft and Nike. I finally had the opportunity to work with him starting in 2007 as he was creating Minimal. You know, having practiced uh, product design, um, I can make the point that's obvious to, to many in the audience that th even the best talent um, doesn't, and team resources, doesn't uh, guarantee success. Um, there's a staggering amount of projects in the in, in product design field that just simply fail. Um, and uh, so the talent itself is insufficient. Obviously things like leadership and having um, 
uh, great luck, timing, um, but also all sorts of intangibles are required to come together to, to make things actually come to life. I want to really speak briefly about um, some of the intangibles that I think define Scott um, post-disciplinary. Uh, Scott doesn't color within the boundaries of process and organizational design. Um, brand, product positioning, uh, the technical, the, uh, even the fulfillment model are part of his uh, design agenda. Um, he's entrepreneurial, as Paula mentioned. Um, the, uh, Scott's hardwired to uh, innovation. Um, he really looks at design from that lens, and he's created Minimal as a platform for uh, serial innovation and business creation. Um, you know, we all can uh, acknowledge Scott's work. It speaks for itself. But this platform, this approach, is uh, itself uh, stretching the proposition for how we think about industrial design practice. Finally, commitment. Scott's uh, really, really runs hard. Um, and like many great uh, performers, whether they're athletes or chefs, musicians, other designers, he makes it look easy. Um, but it didn't come easy. Um, his tolerance for failure is extremely high. But he always gets up and he learns from that. Um, He's also a loyal and committed partner, a great collaborator. I'm really, truly honored to present Scott Wilson, the Product Design Award from the Cooper Hewitt. Like Bob, I have notes. I usually am an organic presenter that goes for hours, but I think I'll stick to the notes and the time limit as best as possible. Uh, thank you, Bob, and the Cooper Hewitt, the jury, and whoever nominated me. And um, I'm just blown away that I'm included in this group of amazing designers. Uh, I guess I never expected um, this to happen. Uh, in fact, somebody called me while I was on out of the country, and I had nobody to celebrate with. Um, so we'll hopefully celebrate later tonight. Um, and I, I know I saw a lot of you. It's great to see a lot of you again today, uh, tonight. Um, I saw a lot of you at the White House in uh, in July with my wife, and I think a lot of us, inclu a lot of you, including us, wondered why we were sitting next to Michelle Obama, and uh, we finally figured it out. Uh, there's an app for that, and we. A bunch of my designers were playing around with this thing called Celebalike uh, at a bar one day after we went to the White House, and they finally got me to see who my doppelganger was. And it turns out that 80% match is uh, Barack Obama, so, which is so obvious. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that's how, and I'm sure the Secret Service had that same app, and that's what happened. Um, so being recognized by this award is undoubtedly the greatest honor in my career. It makes the countless hours of obsessing over the details, hoping to make a difference even more meaningful. Um, but behind any success, we all know that there are many others that really help make it a reality. I just want to take a moment to thank some of the uh, people that supported me along the way. Um, and I have a list here, and hopefully it won't go too fast. <laughs> of course, my father. Uh, who introduced me to design at an early age. I can't be more grateful for that. Um, it's nothing better than doing your hobby for your living. I, and my mother, who has been uh, with me in spirit for the last 20 years, watching over me. Um, my wife, Nicole, and my family, who are my biggest supporters and who have tolerated my obsession with making everything better. <laughs> and my mentors, who have taught me so much and in, empowered me uh, to be who I am. Uh, it's Paul Clock, John Colwait, Doug Satsker, who's here, um, Marty Thaler, Tim Parsi, Ed Boyd, Ray Riley, Dave Scannoni, Mark Parker, and Beth Dickstein. Um, my influencers that I was lucky enough to meet and work with along my journey. Bill Mogridge, whose pivotal role in design will never be forgotten. Inspirational design minds like Ross Lovegrove, who is also here. <laughs> uh, Naoto Fukusawa from IDEO Days, Sam Heck, uh, 
fortunate enough to work with Philippe Stark and Madeleine Croissant back, in ID, uh, back at Thompson days with Doug, who I was like, in 93, I was like, Philippe who? And, um, and uh, very naive coming out of uh, school. Uh, Julian Brown and Joshua Prince Ramis, who I grew up in Virginia playing baseball with. Um, my clients who have believed in me, namely John Ikeda, John Harris, Carl Ledbetter, Bob Arco, and Marie Johnson. And a special thank you to Yancey Strickler, who couldn't be here tonight, and his team at Kickstarter for creating a platform that allowed me to inspire a new generation of design entrepreneurs. And last but not least, all my colleagues and friends that I have learned the most from over the last 20 years at Keck Associates, Thompson, IDO, ACO, Nike, Motorola, Minimal, and Lunatic, I look forward to living up to the expectations that come with this award and continuing to help make a difference through design. Thank you. And also, thank you to Tom, uh, Tom Brown for my tux. I rarely dress up. It was a toss-up between this and the exquisite Hellraiser um, suit, but uh, I think I chose uh, the more uh, risky one. So. <laughs> Congratulations, Scott. Uh, we conclude our award ceremony with the Lifetime Achievement Award, celebrating individuals whose contributions have made a lasting impact on design practice and the everyday experience of design. Our 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award honors Richard Saul Worman. Over the last 50 years, Richard has had a profound impact on the way we see information, the way we exchange ideas. He has written, designed, and published more than 83 books, including the Access series, which redefined the way we travel. Since 1984, when he founded TED, he has continually redefined the conference experience with TEDMED. EG conferences, and just last month, the WWW conference celebrating improvised conversations. Next, he receives the gold medal from Trinity College Dublin, an annual award that has been presented since 1780. Here to present the Lifetime Achievement Award is world-renowned architect and Cooper Hewitt's inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award winner and an old friend of mine, uh, Frank Gary. I just realized, Frank, how long we went back. I met your kids when they were in grade school, and he just showed me pictures of wedding pictures of one of his sons. So uh, time has marched on, and we are thrilled you're here with us this evening. Frank Gary. So um, I was at her wedding. Uh, Richard is so excited about this <laughs> that he made me so nervous I even wrote notes about what to say. But um, since we're the last ones, I'd like you to indulge me and let me have his wife, Gloria Naj, come up and stand beside me to protect me. Where is she? Are you coming? <laughs> I met her first. <laughs> I'm not going to let her speak. <laughs> so Richard's been a friend of mine for more than half of my lifetime. And I, I love him very much, dearly. He claims not to be an expert in anything. He keeps reminding me that. And I would say that he is really an expert in friendship. Uh, his life work has been uh, demystifying the knowledge systems which inform our lives. It's Talmudic. It's like why everything, why and how, and through that, he's left a trail of amazing friends and experiences. 
and he has supported a lot of people in their early years, including me and some others here. And we want to thank him for that. I forgot what else I was going to say. <laughs> Uh, he has uh, supported leaders in innovation in a myriad of disciplines in the sciences, the arts, and every other topic that surrounds our lives that piqued his curiosity. And he is a very curious motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> He's a certified world treasure and a great friend and a worthy recipient of this award, please. I have to stay here? Yeah. Stay here. What's the difference? No, just stay here. No, I'm talking. <laughs> sit there, sit there. He didn't introduce me to you when you came over. It was rude. There's too many lights in my face. A little while ago, I had a pee. And I went to the bathroom, and I met about eight people I knew very well. There are so many people here that I know. There's just a lot of people, and I would like all the people that I know to stand. Come on, would you all stand? You're not standing. I can't see. You could just stand. And that's not trivial. It's not trivial to know a lot of people. I didn't say people that liked me. I just said people I know. And, and that's really, that is, that's, that's been my life of being around people who were smarter than me and who, uh, who I could con, and, <laughs> and like in Tom Sawyer, who would paint my fence and pay me money. Um, there's a bunch of people on those tables over there that, that, because you could have letters written this year of recommendation, wrote me letters of recommendation, so I invited them to dinner, and I had to pay for their ticket. They're amazing people. I mean, Massimo Vignelli, who got this award before. Frank got the first award. Moshe Zofti, Stefan Sagmeister. Um, oh, I'm forgetting all the names. But they're all over there, and they're just. My life has been changed by so many of you. And giving me, well, John came in who helped me with my, the, putting together the, the box of shit I had to send in here because I couldn't do it. <laughs> I don't literally know how to do anything. <laughs> Frank, once, once the, he, he was angry because his award looked different than this one. I have to give him mine and he's gonna give me his. <laughs> They changed the design and he didn't like that. I'm very proud to be here tonight, I really am. I'm, re I'm not making light of any of this. Everything I said, which seems maybe trying to be funny or is a little humorous and making you laugh, but making you laugh is just wonderful. And it really, it's really serious. I'm serious about what I owe to my wife. Three of my children are here tonight. My friends are here. The people who sat on each side of me, Frank on one side, Nancy Green on the other side, the people at other tables, Red Burns, who I've known forever, who got an award tonight, 
Bobby Greenberg. I mean, I could just, in this room is an astonishing group of extraordinary people. And they planned the meeting, this meeting wrong. Because we should have just talked to each other longer. We should have introduced each other to each other longer. Because the value of this room is the space between. Not these funny little thank you, thank you stories at the end. I mean, that's, this is the least interesting part of the evening. It should have been 90% just talking and walking around and then just give you these little glass things. I thank you so deeply. I am really honored. I am really blessed uh, to have such an interesting life. And you've all made my life more interesting. And what, what when I'm asked, because I'm, I'm a, this old fuck now, and I'm 77, when I'm asked, I had to say that because John said, don't say that tonight. <laughs> when I'm asked, what do you want out of life? Or what is, what, and I just say, interesting days. And that's what we want, is to have, I want tomorrow for everybody here to be interesting. Just have interesting days, whatever that means to you. Just have interesting days. Thank you so very, very much. Thank my family in particular. Thank my friends. And I'll meet her on the way out. Thank you, Frank, and congratulations again to our Lifetime Achievement winner, Richard Saul Warman. <laughs> the best of design isn't just in this room tonight. Cooper Hewitt exhibitions are traveling all over the country, all over the world. And please don't forget to nominate for the 2013 National Design Awards. Visit cooperhewitt.com. Tonight, we have recognized the accomplishments of an extraordinary range of designers. Please join me in raising a glass to this outstanding group of winners. Cheers. And the confab Richard was talking about will start shortly in the lobby. Uh, thank you all for supporting Cooper Hewitt. And congratulations again to all the winners. And uh, we hope you'll be back with us next year. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank mm -hmm. you.